Hi, my name is Yawa Hansen Kwao. I'm the executive director for Emerging Public Leaders, and it's been such an awesome experience being here with the ELF team in Nairobi. Uh, we worked together uh, and partnered on a scoping visit so that we could explore the possibility of launching the Public Service Fellowship here in Kenya. Our fellowship program, which has been operational in Liberia and in Ghana for over 10 years, has given young people the opportunity to have a merit-based pathway into government service. We work as a catalyst and as a partner to governments around the world to help them bring in talented young people and give them the mentoring, the coaching, the skills, and the pathway um, into public service leadership. And for me, this past week has been a learning journey where we've gone to different government officials, we've visited different counties, uh, we've met with different young people, and we're trying to understand the state of the public service in Kenya. We're trying to get feedback from youth on why aren't they in public service, do they want to work in government, what are some of the barriers that are actually in their way from actually getting a job in government. We are asking ourselves a lot of questions and one of the questions we're asking ourselves is whether or not there are young people in public service and I think the answer is an obvious yes. Are they having an impact in the roles that they're playing in public service? Are they creating a difference in the positions that they've had an opportunity to have influence in? Are they conducting themselves differently from other public servants or what we have known public servants to be? Are they injecting fresh ideas into the public service and are they providing solutions? The Africa Youth Charter has provisions that youth should participate in governance and they, that they must form part of delegations to intergovernmental conversations. Together with Emerging Public Leaders, this week we've been going around meeting different leaders, civil society organizations, youth leaders, government officials to ask the question that this Public Leaders Fellowship Program that emerging public leaders have been able to implement successfully in Ghana and Liberia. Can it run here in Kenya? And we are impressed, not, not just by the people, but by the passion. There's such a passion, and there's such a technical expertise here, and we hope that after today's deliberations, we can create a framework together of how to bring this innovation that has worked well in Liberia and Ghana here in Kenya. The truth of the matter is a lot of the youth want shortcuts. And a lot of the corruption cases that we have today, if you look at most of them, you will see a lot of youths behind it. Because either they've been misled, misled um, that they can, get the, they can get their way through quickly, by amassing wealth um, without going through the hard way. But this is unacceptable. And this program is a very important program. And that's why when it was explained to me, it didn't take much time for me to accept and say, yes, I will come, as long as it's a program that emphasizes on integrity and the need of people to work hard. I have noted that it started in Liberia after the war. We, therefore, are also, just like Liberia, coming from um, a sort of strife um, because of corruption. That same corruption that has eaten into our infrastructure, that has destroyed our fabric, that has reversed the systems and the structures that have been established. Um, and therefore, this program is going to be pertinent in ensuring that we re-establish our systems, in ensuring that we establish and continue to ensure that integrity thrives within the systems that we have, and that we grow naturally and not artificial, um, and not through shortcuts. So doctor, one of the things that makes you stand out is the way you put your foot down and you say 
my people must be taken care of. It's all about service delivery. And we've seen how you've taken a front line from both angles as an activist and also as a leader. So tell us, what exactly should we do to change the culture to quick service delivery? What should we do? The majority of the young people have started to admire you know, the, the schemes that get you either rich or get you prosperity very fast. And we have shunned hard work. So we, we, we no longer want to be the people going to the farms. We no longer want to be the people advocating for that mother at home who cannot access health care. As long as you, you have your insurance, you have a small private insurance, you can go to Nairobi Hospital under the can. So what do you think we should do to create an academy of leaders in terms of young people? I liked the point that uh, the DPP made earlier on about getting back to our African traditional values. Okay, because African traditional societies were very concerned about the common good. So I think one of the most critical issues we need to address is, is values. We need to, to, to sort of think very carefully about our values. What does success mean to us? Because I think for many people, uh, success means just climbing the career ladder, you see, and making a lot of money. There's still some sort of brilliance in you. You can be maybe street smart, but then you're not book smart. So how do you connect those two? You can be book smart, but not street smart. How do you connect those two, right? So we move into recognizing our strengths in all parts, book-wise, street-wise, and otherwise, and then collectively come together, um, bring that to the, to the transferable skill set, and then move forward from there. Look at the gaps that we need to fill. If it's gaps in public service, for example, what needs to happen and not just a matter of okay there's that role that's there let's fill it let's put someone there and say that we've filled that role what needs to happen what skills does this person need to have in order to have the particular good job done in that one one spot that's lacking and i mean our organizations are trying <laughs> to do that such as um, this one but then there is a lack of one recognition in terms of okay so this organization is trying to do this but then what do we benefit you know a lot of people look at benefit being monetary but then what is the other side of the skill set the other side of things being done and how well they're being done what needs to be done to attract the young people to civil service mm. I like your, the second part of your question in terms of attracting because I was actually going to start my statement on we're talking about public service as being an opportunity for young people when young people don't even see public service. When in 2016 the research showed that 55 year old is the average age of a person in public service. Yet we talk about the majority of our population being below 35. There's a disconnect. But the work that we do with Siasa Place, we do work in 10 counties and we mainly focus on public participation, like I mentioned, but social accountability mainly. And them understanding the avenues that are present within the constitution that they can engage in and participate. We've seen young people entering boards, we've seen young people now entering public service and seeing it as an opportunity. But it took a whole year of education of engagement, of persistence, of their own ownership, where young people have to feel, this is my community, I have to do something about the change for my own community. It took a whole year. What every young person must know is that beyond the talk, beyond the complaining, beyond the whining, beyond the misery, beyond your situation, there is an action to get you out of there. Most times, that action will have to be from yourself. The first point we had is that for the youth to be involved in a manner that is ethical, we must indoctrinate the youth into believing that you can be in public service and be ethical. Nothing is more powerful than a story and we must begin to tell the story of powerful uh, people who are in public service like Wangari Mathai and Tom Boyer who made change and were ethical in the way they made change. The second point is uh, capacity building. 
if the youth are to be involved in public service, we must have capacity for them. Yes, they can volunteer, but is it possible for them to be given lunch, such that when they come to the office, they will not be involved in unethical means to try and get uh, uh, some side money because they are hungry. There must be a system of mentorship from those in office that are older. Just because we are youth does not mean that we cannot be taught by those that are ahead of us. We must learn from them, they should support us, they should teach us, and we must allow ourselves to uh, be taught by them. When you're serving people, you're creating impact. A job is somewhere you wake up and collect a paycheck. It does not necessarily have to involve you creating impact. So it's also important to remind our young people that when we are talking about service, it has to be backed up by impact. It's not about also the paycheck. I'm not saying, don't misquote me, I'm not saying that people should not be compensated or should not be appreciated. But as we appreciate you, what are you creating or what change have you made in the society? So in the spirit of intergenerational um, work, so looking at how we have reverse mentorship in different departments to catalyze innovation within those um, departments. Because so, we still need capacity building within public sector, we can't exactly get rid of everybody. But if you have young people who are placed there and actually can have an effect of mentoring more experienced public servants, then you're actually changing how you know governance is done from the inside out, as well as encouraging new public leaders to come into the system. Uh, there should be communication skills and other soft skills impacted immediately at the beginning of the fellowship. Also, the use of social media as a strategy for communication through, through the fellowship. We also talked about evolution, evolution of technology. We are talking about artificial intelligence. We are talking about IoT, Internet of Things. We are in the fourth industrial revolution. It's time to get out of the third industrial revolution of computers because I think we should be step by step with how the technology is moving so that at least when we are bringing this technology on board, we are not trying to look at it in terms of how it's supposed to deny us jobs, but how we are supposed to include ourselves in that uh, diversion to the extent that it does not, not only make our work easier, but it makes our ourselves like think technologically and make work easier more every other day. Do we have a way of channeling the data that of, of the work that we do to one repository? I don't know whether there's a portal where maybe we can, maybe ELF can champion that. Come up with a data, uh, a database or a portal where that coordinates most of these youth activities and the government could even tap into that because many times we go to the government to ask them, show us the data, how many young people have been uh, employed, for example, this year. They start fumbling, they see, I, I wish they, some of them were here. They start fumbling looking at other ministries uh, or talk to the PS, the PS or go to the line managers. That data needs to come out. So my addition was to group one with regards to the content and I like that group six raised the issue of partnering with the Kenya School of Government but I think the issue of evidence informed decision making needs to come through in the content uh, so that we see how does the public service make sure it's leveraging research, it's leveraging uh, monitoring and evaluation data because that's a current gap uh, when you look at how the public service is operating. So once people are trained from the beginning that every uh, initiative, every program we are looking at, we are evaluating, is it working? Then the research from academia that is policy relevant, how are we getting it into the policy and programs? Yeah, so, and with regards to funding for such initiatives, I think like the Hewlett Foundation is very keen on building strong governance institutions with relation to the use of evidence in decision making. So that bit that I've mentioned could potentially be funded by the Hewlett Foundation. If we all were holding conversations like this across the country, a lot of misconceptions and not knowing what to do would have been solved long time ago. We don't have to wait until when we are too old. So I feel younger by just listening to you. We are a commission that is bent to serve Wananchi, citizen-centric. It's been a prompt, pleasing pleasure, as well as a privilege to host you. And for the wonderful audience, we really thank you for being here to make this a wonderful moment. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>